nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So good morning everyone. Um, this lecture is focused on uh, quantum dots and in particular on long-range strain to give you a multi-scale phenomenon that is occurring at the nanometer scale. To, so you see something that you slightly different than what you normally see when you do electronic structure uh, work or d electronic device work. Um, so let's start out with um, a description of the self-assembled indium arsenide, gallium arsenide quantum dots. Uh, those are grown uh, these, these pyramidal or dome-shaped dots are grown on a substrate that is uh, not quite fitting, meaning the indium arsenide quantum dots have a larger lattice constant than the gallium arsenide uh, substrate material. And the way you can think about that is you're trying to grow something that doesn't quite fit, like where you place Legos on top of a surface uh, and you can only squeeze in so many when, until they don't want to be squeezed in anymore and then they tend to fall apart. Well, these guys clump up, and they clump up in something that is uh, pyramidal shape or uh, dome shaped. So strain is a, a very critical element in the growth of these structures. And if what I sketched here is a, a sort of a sliver of a quantum dot, and too small to be realistic, but to give you an idea, and if you take a, a slice uh, and look at the bond length to the structure along the, uh, the lateral distance. What you see there is a, a, a small bond length change from roughly 0.059 to 0.064 or so. So it's actually a relatively small bond length change. So you might say, well, that doesn't seem like a whole lot. Well, if you think about orbitals interacting with each other from one atom to the next, you can at least in the back of your head sort of see that if you had an overlap of an s orbital interacting with an uh, p orbital and now you start to change the angle and the distance between those two slightly on an uh, quantum mechanical sense you, you change the overlap of those matrix elements or of those uh, wave functions quite significantly. So while strain might be a small effect on the mechanical disorder, a few percent, like three, four, five percent, it can be a tremendous effect on the band structure. In fact, indium arsenide bulk is around 0.4 EV. Around 400 milliliter volt is the band gap of bulk indium arsenide. That's one thing you should keep in mind. Now, if you put it into a strain environment like this gallium arsenide strain system on quantum dots, uh, roughly the band gap doubles to roughly 800 milliectron volt. Okay, you double the band gap by a change of four or five percent of lattice constant. Okay, that's a huge effect. I mean, those are some numbers to keep in mind. If somebody asks you, is strain important in semiconductors? Yes. Very important, okay? And the picture you have to keep in mind is given here in this image that band structure is due to atoms coupling to another atom. And you change the overlap of these couplings dramatically if you just change the angle slightly or the distance slightly, okay? That is what you have to keep in mind in the back of your head when people talk about strain and disorder Right? That's the concept you have to have in the back of your head. All right. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. <coughs> let's look at a, a 30 nanometer diameter quantum dot that is 5 nanometer high and it's embedded in gallium arsenide. So one thing you may do um, in, in the uh, computational procedure, as we discussed in the previous lecture, is that you start from a physical structure and you assume it to be ordered. Okay? 
And then you start this valence force field calculation where you think of these atoms as balls on the spring and you relax their position, okay? So they, they relax themselves to minimize their total strain energy. So that moves the atoms slightly and then in the next step we kind of lock these atoms in place and we calculate the eigenstates of this big Hamiltonian matrix that is constructed as a function effectively of these atom positions and the atom kind. Okay? That locks our Hamiltonian in place. All right. So then we calculate eigenstates and we want to figure out, well, what is the eigenenergy of this type of system, right? And there's a couple of different boundary conditions one can look at. One can say, well, I want to assume that I have this embedded uh, uh, quantum dot and I can s assume that maybe the system can just breathe out, right? I'm going to assume that there's nothing that constrains the edges of my computational box. That's one assumption I can do on the strain condition. And if I do that and I increase the size of my box, if I make this box bigger and bigger and bigger, so I have this buffer thickness here, I'm ramping it from 4 nanometers around an indium arsenide quantum dot and make it as big as 20 nanometers in all dimensions. What you find is that the eigenenergy of your ground state of the electron is starting to move as a function of energy. <coughs> you might say that's kind of strange, right? I have a wave function that's confined in the center of the quantum dot, right? And now I make this buffer that's around it bigger and bigger. Your normal intuition would have been nothing should change, right? The wave function is in the center, there's a buffer around it, a barrier material, what would change? If I do this for an indium gallium arsenide quantum dot, so a little bit more gallium in it than in the pure indium arsenide dot, you see roughly the same effect but not, on a, uh, not as strong. So here on the indium arsenide dot, you change the gap by roughly 150 or more millielectron volts, right? Uh, sorry, the, the eigenenergy of the electrons. 150 millielectron volts is a huge value for, for an, uh, an eigenstate to go up and down, right? If you were talking about optical line width, or sorry, optical emission, uh, that's a quite a big uh, difference in frequency that you would get in your system. <laughs>